Right, guys, we're gonna we're gonna get going. So, um, just more people will join probably in, in the coming minutes, but we'll we'll get going now because <clears> I want to make sure we get a good forty five minutes with uh, our special guests. So, welcome to today's masterclass. Um, today, the theme is physical development, strength, and conditioning. Um, so this player development masterclass series is brought to you by the dome and within the dome there is the west canada soccer academy which is the soccer platform uh with the dome um so what we're trying to do is we're trying to connect the players parents and, and coaches of central alberta with the english premier league um and we're very fortunate today to have someone with us that will bring great knowledge and experience to this topic um the Dome's mission is really to promote and support long-term athletic development, um, but in a holistic way. We all know the technical <clears> tactical <throat> of, of soccer, but sometimes the, the physical, the psychological lifestyle gets overlooked. So this series is really to promote a holistic view to long-term athletic development and how the Dome really wants to kind of bring that to the, the Dome athletes. Um, just a couple of housekeepings. Uh, first of all, anyone that's tuned in today, if you can make sure your microphone is muted and your video is disabled, um, all communication will happen through the chat. Um, so if you have any questions for the two guests, um, please type that in the chat. And um, during their discussions, I'll be monitoring the chat. And if need be, I'll chirp into those guys during the conversation or there'll be a <coughs> Q and A section at the end where we'll, um, we'll go through some of the questions in the chat. Um, other than that, first of all, I would like to just hand over to our first guest, who's Jim Fredrickson. Jim is the Vice President and Head of Strength and Conditioning for The Dome. Jim's gonna facilitate the discussion today. Um, and then I would really like to give a warm welcome uh, to uh, a previous colleague of mine and a friend of mine from, from over in the UK, Adam Yates. Uh, Adam is the lead academy sports scientist for Burnley Football Club in the English Premier League. Um, Adam has a wealth of knowledge, previous ex-player, um, and now working in the Premier League, developing uh, young professionals, hopefully to come on and establish a career in the game. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Jim and Adam, and you might see me pop in and out as we go through. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Jason. Um, yeah, thanks so much for everybody for turning in. Uh, we're looking forward to having a chance to sit down with Adam and just pick his brain a little bit about some of the experience he has. He's, uh, you know, maybe a little bit um, special in some ways uh, in the terms of he's got a background in the sport at a very high level. And he's also, you know, a strength and conditioning coach and uh, Head of sports science. So that is something that is is tremendously valuable for us to tap into as a community, just to get some of the knowledge from from Adam that he can share with us. So just to give you a quick background on myself, uh, I've been in a strength and conditioning coach for the last 22 years. Uh, I've ran my own business uh, for 17 of those years, and I've uh, worked with amateur athletes and pro athletes that entire time. I had uh, the privilege of uh, doing that my whole entire career. And so it's a passion of mine. I love it. And uh, I really still enjoy watching athletes progress and develop. And I think that the Dome and what they're doing is, is a good fit for the next step of my career, uh, developing athletes in multiple sports. And not only that, but educating the athletes uh, a little bit more uh, organized fashion and consistency with all the different aspects and pillars that are involved in that. So um, I know with Adam, um, we had a little bit of a chat this week and, you know, I got the chance to, to hear from you and hear a little bit about what you're doing. So I'm super excited to share with, uh, with uh, everyone on the call, just a little bit of your knowledge. So I'll just get right into it and just, uh, just ask you. So as a former pro, you know, what, what was it that really, give you the passion to become a strength and conditioning coach or what kind of set you on that course? Well, I'd probably say as a player, the, the physical aspects was always a strength of mine. So I had a, obviously an inkling to be interested in it anyway, uh, but it was during my injury about age 19, I spent a lot of time sort of rehabbing from my injury, a lot of time in the gym and a lot of time to, to do a bit of reading and observe and learn from some, some professionals in the industry. And that's where I really got my passion for it. Uh, and of course, when, when my injury was, 
than able to allow me to return. I, I developed such a passion for, for the physical side of the game and that's the route that I chose to, to stay in, in the elite game. So that's where it all stemmed from, really. Awesome. No, that's neat because it really is a, a great perspective, um, just being a player and being a coach because it's like you've been through it all. You've kind of, you know what it feels like to be pushed. You know what it feels like to be tired. You know what it feels like to be, you know, challenged to get to that yeah. next level. So I think that's really something that's really helpful uh, when you're working in a gym with someone who's done it before. So that's, uh, I think that's something that's uh, really awesome. Um, you know, as a former player uh, and, and with your perspective, you know, how important is strength and conditioning to maximizing performance and, and for really taking that next step? In, in the modern day game, it's massive. If you'd had asked me the same question about 20 years ago in England, it was more focused on the technical aspect. But in recent years, uh, Jason will vouch for me as well on this, the, the physical aspect of the game over here in England has, has been improved and has risen so much that the demands placed on the players now, the physical and mental demands is, is a lot higher. The outputs that the players are producing in terms of distance covered, the speeds that they're hit, the hitting, the strength, etc. It's, it's, it's really excelled. So in order to compete at the highest level now, you have to also be very good physically. Your technical abilities will only get you so far in the game. It might get you an amateur career, which some people are happy with, but if you want to be the elite and if you want to reach the top of your game, everything's got, everything's got to be worked on. And the physical aspect is, in some cases, um, at some levels, just as important as the technical aspect. Right. Thanks. Yeah, it really does seem like that with, with every sport, that it's really progressed and, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely evolved and, and, and become... Uh, so important and I think like some of the aspects even now um, you know the the polish that's on it now it's more a lot of them are being more concerned with you know overall longevity of the career and doing exactly. things right right not just working hard but you know putting some thought to it um, maximizing you know every part of the workout where there is you know my experience is when I first started training a lot of it was about just hard work right and it's like it's really as you know there's a lot more to it than just hard work there's a strategy to it Right. Yeah. So awesome. Awesome. Um, one of the other questions I was thinking is, you know, what is the primary focus to optimize results when starting uh, with athletes and strength and conditioning? And, and like what age would you suggest in your in your experience, in your opinion, in the, in the modern day? You know, when, when is it appropriate to start and what does that focus look like? So the, the belief we have um, at Burnley is that you know, you're never too young to start S&C but it just, it just looks different at certain ages. Um, so I'll give you an insight as to how we do it here. So under nines to under 11s, um, it's kind of, we, we want to get the lads moving. We want to get the lads moving in different ways. We want them to have fun. So it's a little bit chaotic. We just chuck the, the players into loads of fun games that obviously tick quite a few boxes for us in terms of movement uh, competences and, and trying to develop different aspects of the, of, of the athlete because you find a lot of players, if they specialize in a certain sport from nine onwards they, they don't pick up the other beneficial aspects of different movements that other sports might bring them so um i can, I can share an example with you of what we do at, at young ages and then talk to you about how we progress that through to 18. Are you happy for me to do that jim yeah that's great so I can share something on my screen uh, so So can everyone see that video? Yep. yep. Yeah. So click play. Can you turn that sound down a little bit? We can't hear you. Sorry, Jason. No problem, mate. Video looked great, though. Did you hear, did you hear what I was saying during that? No. Nope. <laughs> uh, can you repeat Sorry. it? Okay, yeah. So basically, that, that video was just showing the, the younger age groups um, on an obstacle course, which we set up in the indoor arena. Uh, the players are obviously having lots of fun. They see it as a fun game. They don't, they don't see the out, outputs or the outcomes that they're getting from that game. But... If you could see the briefly in that video, there was jumping, landing, turning, sprinting, changing direction, and it was all done in a fun, competitive environment. 
which the coaches got involved with, as you saw as well. So that's kind of how we do it at the younger age groups. As we progress to 12, 13, 14, we still make it fun, but there's a little bit more structure and a little bit more thought behind the sessions that we put on. So we teach similar movements, but a little bit more coached. So a few more cue points, a few more on, on, on hand coaching. Um, and we introduce them to a little bit of body weight strength work. And then when we get to 15s, 16s, we start to teach more complex movements on the field and in the gym under sort of you know controlled loads dependent on, on the athlete's competency. And then when we get to 17, 18, 19, hopefully those complex movements have been mastered and we can really start to put some load on the athletes. So that's how we progress it. And going back to your original question, Jim, s &C starts at a young age for us. It just looks very different from what it does at 18, 19, 20. Excellent. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, I've looked at a couple other clubs and, um, you know, Arsenal and different things, and it's just, it, you can see that trend. Uh, it's the same way. Uh, I agree 100%. That's exactly how, you know, we look at it as, you know, joint, joint mobility and joint function. And yeah. uh, that, that's where you're talking about movement. And then, like you said, I think having games and stuff um, is super key. I hear that a lot from a lot of people. It's so important at that young age. Uh, keep them engaged, keep having fun, keep it competitive. And at the same time, still screening movement and still learning what you can about that athlete. So, no, that's awesome. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, Jim, just to come back to that as well, just to yeah. give them insight, we have, we, uh, we put other sports on for them in that arena. So, that was just a snapshot of the arena. In that arena, there, there's loads of different sports going on with different groups. So, we have taekwondo, gymnastics, rugby. Um, a general S and C station where they do a few a bit of ladder work and change of direction, um, and then obviously, as you touched on there, we do we do screen the, them as well to see if there's any benefit of these things, and we've seen some improvements in speed and the young athletes injuries sustained as well, and that's at a young age, so it just shows you the benefit of it. And hopefully, we we started this a, a few years ago, and hopefully, in a few years, we're going to get the benefits at first team level, and we're bringing these players through. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, one, one other thing that's worth pointing out is just, you know, the, it's almost like you, you need to uh, somewhat train to move, right? So I think that's what uh, a lot of these kids, uh, when they come in, they're, they're, you know, they're maybe a little bit detrained. And sometimes, you know, some of the, those things are so important at the start, even almost more important than the technical. So I think, uh, exactly, you know, yeah. That's where it's a good good balance. At that age, the, the brain is like a sponge. So the more you yeah. can do at the younger ages, the better you, you'll be as you grow. You'll be a more complete athlete. Right, right. Actually, in our last call yesterday, that uh, was that was exactly one of the points that was made. Just just how much they can learn at a young age and how exactly. beneficial that is. So awesome. Um, you know, another thing that a lot of people ask is, you know, how many how many sessions, you know, would it would be, you know, I guess the common you know, ground for someone like yourself that's training with your athletes in season versus off season. What would you say would be a? You know, if there was a number in season. What would that number be? Like yeah. In the off season. Uh, so generally, we start with the off season. So the off season for us is it's changed recently in in, in recent years in England. So the off season uh, back in the eighties and nineties used to be a total rest for the players, mm -hmm. and then pre season was to get fit. But now the off-season, we do condition the lads so they come into pre-season at a high level and then we can start them higher. So the off-season, we hit about three gym sessions a week and about three running sessions a week as well. Within that, there's a little bit of movement, but that becomes more specific before they come back into the season. Right. In season, of course, the, the condition, they've laid the foundations and we, we hit them with a lot more sessions. So for your full-time athletes, it could be four to five gym sessions a week. Of course, we have four on-field sessions that the players have to do, and that's pre-training or during training, which is your, your mobility, your agility, your speed, your power, uh, and your endurance. Um, so they have four or five gym sessions, about four on-field sessions, and of course, they have the game, which is, tends to be on a Saturday. So compared to off-season to in-season, in-season is a lot more intense. The off-season is where we lay the foundations to be able to do this work in season. That's right. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, and would you say that, you know, has that changed a lot in the last, you know, since you were playing? How much has it changed since then, would you say? I'd say, I'd say it's, 
it's similar that obviously the knowledge of, in this area is improved. Um, I've not played now for 10 years. So my, I sustained my injury about 11 years ago. I've not, I've not played properly for, for 10 years. And that's when sports science and, and the physical aspect was really starting to develop. But I'd say now it's, it's a lot, there's a lot more demands placed on the players. So right. not only right. do they have a lot of technical sessions, they have just as many, if not more, physical sessions as well, especially right. at Burnley. Right. Right. Another thing that, you know, uh, well, I even said to Noah and, and Jason, I hesitated to talk about it because it's kind of a misunderstood thing, but, you know, overtraining and working and, and you know, what's too much. And I kind of thought, well, let's lead into the question of, you know, how important is hydration and nutrition to optimize performance? And that, that probably has a pretty large impact on, you know, what, what a player can and can't do. And so I thought maybe we'd throw that one at you and see what you can. Yeah, it's, uh, it's massive and it's something that we really drive home. Of course, if you, if you're hydrated or if, if if you're dehydrated, then you then you you're more likely to make mistakes, become mentally fatigued quicker. Your 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 performance, your physical performance is decreased. Uh, it impairs your concentration, and you're also, which we really bang home to the players, if you're dehydrated, um, you're more susceptible to to, to sustaining injuries. So it, it, we have we have ten clear points at Burnley. That we, that we drive home to the players. And we do a lot of education around hydration, a lot of workshops. So I'll just share with you the 10 points. If anyone wants to take a picture of this, you're more than welcome. So if everyone can see that, yep. uh, they're, the, they're the 10 take home points that we really drive home for the players, just to try and help them because they're still younger lads are still learning. So I'm just going to jump in quickly and remind everybody viewing that this video will be available. We're going to put it up next week with all the other four videos. So if people are scrambling for a pen and paper, don't panic. It's going to be available for everyone to see next week as well. Yeah, um, cheers, Jason. We, we test the lads every morning. So when they come into the building, one of the first things they do is a hydration test. And that's not to try and catch the players out and say you're dehydrated. It's to try and help the players be hydrated for when they train, to help them perform better. And obviously remain injury free. So we do, we test the lads with something called an osmolarity check, which is a simple piece of equipment. The lads give a urine sample, we analyze it, it gives us a number, and then this number is compared against this chart. Um, I don't know if everyone can see that. So we have a rating system, zero to 200 is what we call overhydrated. So it's when the players drank almost too much and they're starting to flush out all their electrolytes and key salts. So the sweet spot is, is, is around 200 to 550 is what we work off. If they're above that, then we should start to drink more water. And as you can see, it goes the higher you go, the more in the red there, very severely dehydrated. Drink water ASAP and continue to have a hydration tablet, and you're at high risk of illness and injury. And then we feed back to the players on a regular basis a chart that looks like that. So each player's sample is analyzed uh, in the the pie chart there, the green is how many times they're hydrated and it's a good visual for the players and obviously you have some players that are really good at it and then we go there, some players who are 61% of the time uh, dehydrated, so that's how we feed it back to the players. So we really drive it home is the answer to your question and it's really important, Jason, uh, Jim. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's going above and beyond what I've seen, player, you know, a lot of the old school ways is you just weigh them when they come in and weigh them when they leave type thing. But yeah. that's really progressive, and uh, yeah, no, that's awesome. That's that's great. Now, uh, another question is: now, can the players see when you have a player say that's uh, proved to not be good at the practice of hydration? Does he see the value now, and can you correlate that to him, or does he not feel the difference? So, if a player has a low score on the hydration, mm -hmm. yeah, we have um, so. We hold the players accountable, especially at the full-time environment. So each player's score is written up on a board. Um, obviously, in, in, some, in some places, the younger age groups comes at a bit ethical issues, but the players are happy for their score to go on a board. So the players walk past that. And obviously, they can see their score and compare them to other people's as well. But they're almost held accountable. And if, if I did a hydration score and it was really bad, then I'd almost be you know, embarrassed that that score was up there and I'd want to do something about it. Obviously, we've got the players' consent to do this, but this is the way we do it. And, and, and it works. It works, to be fair. And obviously, if a player gets a, a high score, we do it 
so there's enough time for that player to be hydrated. So we find it really effective. Awesome. Oh, that's really good. That's uh, I, 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 even working with some pro teams. I haven't seen guys doing that. So, and is it is it super? Is it practical? Like you find it's a big deal because I mean, measuring urine seems seems, but you've done it a lot. So it's not yeah. a big deal. Pretty simple. No, it's not a big deal, and the yeah. players are used to it. So it's right. just a part of their day now. So they come in, pick up the pot, give a sample. Obviously, we take all the the uh, hygienic approaches. We wear gloves. We analyze it, and the players. A lot of the players are keen to see after breakfast what what score they've got. So that's right. that's what we want. We want to create a culture yes. that comes ingrained. Yeah, that's a that's a key word right there. Just the culture and, like you said, being accountable. Um, yeah, that's that's great. Um, another one I was going to ask you is, um, do you see a trend in the best performing players over the years in in the game? Like you've been in it a long time. You've you've played yourself. You've been involved in the game your whole life, really. So you know, do you see some trends in in you know, in, high, in the best performing players? Do you mean best performing in physically or best I, I, I mean as an overall, like, like um, performing as in leadership, like leadership in, in the game, leadership in the, in the dressing room, leadership in, in culture, like just, just who they are. Do you see any trends in these kids? Yeah, I mean, I, I've been fortunate. I've been fortunate to play and work with some top players, some of that have gone on to play for England at the top level, won Premier Leagues. Um, we've also recently uh, produced quite a high profile player at Burnley and the, the, the common themes really are obviously fundamentally they have good technique that's a given you know if you haven't got good technique you're not going to make it in the game they have a desire desire to win desire to get yeah. better desire to improve they have, they have high standards so you know high standards for themselves but also for others and the teammates uh, they, have, they have character so by that, I mean, they, they have a presence, they, yeah. they have a, a character on the pitch, off the pitch. Um, they, they, they really stand out in that, in that sense. And they're, they're professional. Every day they come into the environment, every, every, every day that they come into, into what they call work. But for me, it's not work. It's, you know, it's, a, it's a pleasure. And they, they, they have a, a professionalism which stands out massively. And, and Jason will, will echo that as well, I'm sure. Yeah, I was actually just going to chirp in just to bring it a little bit closer to home. All those things you described there, actually Scott Arfield um, probably is the epitome of all of those things. And he's now the national team captain with Canada when Scott was at Burnley. Um, I think everything you mentioned there, whether it was, and I would probably say with Scott, it was a little bit of quiet leadership, but he was outstanding at all those things. So he was a real iconic player. And there's a, there's a, there's a philosophy at Burnley. We know that from the first team, but Scott was brilliant with that. Uh, gents, just a couple of questions, if I could fire one in. Um, of course. Uh, there's a question from Lonnie that I'm going to come to at the end because it links with a few observations I've made. But we've got one from, from Gracie Says. It says, we know there isn't a universal workout or program for all athletes, but are there non-negotiable aspects that you try to develop and establish in every player? It's a, it's a great question. Um, obviously, we'll start, start with the basics. Football is an endurance sport, so it's quite different to a few sports that you might have in uh, Canada and America, which are more sort of power and they get a little bit more rest within, within the games. So you've got to have good endurance. That's kind of your foundation. So if you're building a house, that's your building block. You need good endurance. And then on top of that, it's kind of like a pyramid you can then build on top of that. So for me, it would be, it would be strength. So endurance, strength, because again, strength underpins everything. Without strength, you can't be powerful. You can't stay injury free. You can't move properly. You can't be quick. And then on top of that is all your, all your additives. So, you, you know, your agility, your change of direction, your rotation, things like that. So they're, they're the key things. I'd start with endurance, get yourself really fit, get out running, you know, and then start to build on top of that. So you can do loads of body weight body weight uh, training at home, squats, simple movement patterns, single leg balance. Sorry if I'm speaking too quick, but hopefully you're writing this down. Uh, single leg balance exercise, just really build the basics. And then on top of that, as soon as you master them, you can then start to add all the, the fancy layers on top. Hopefully that answers your question. Yes. Great. Um, back to um, our other question. Uh, just finishing up on that when you were talking about, you know, some of the things that you've noticed in all players, um, you know, desire, high, high standards, character, professionalism, 
um, you know, all these things, you know, when you really look at that, the reason why I kind of mentioned that and asked that question is, is because something that's super important to the dome and, and what we do is, is, is a culture, you know, and just creating that culture of, of all the things that we just talked about is one of those pillars that we're talking about, right? So um, I'm sure you've, um, you know, could speak to that a little bit about, you know, how, how, how important is culture uh, in, in, in team and, and in what you do? Yeah, culture is massive and it's something that we really drive home here. It comes from the first team manager who's been very successful. And I think if, if you have a good culture, everyone's singing off the same hymn sheet and you can all pull together and be successful. So obviously it starts with the coach, S&C coach, um, the players. As long as you build a good culture and everyone's fighting for the same thing, that's going to get you success. If you don't have a culture and you don't have a strong work ethic and you're not singing off the same hymn sheet and you don't have the same beliefs, then you're not going to be as successful as that as you, as you could be. Right. Right. Yeah. No kidding. So that, that kind of leads into my last question that I had, and then I'm going to turn it back to Jason. If, if you want to uh, jump in with a few questions, maybe some of the viewers have, um, but you know, in, at, at, at the end of the day, when you look at everything that we're kind of talking about, you know, do you believe that a holistic health approach to athletic development is optimal for performance? Is that your belief or how, how do you feel about that? <clears throat> Definitely. So we, we've already touched on it um, a couple of times during this uh, during this conference. You can't just focus on one thing. So at the start, I was talking about you can't just focus on your technique. You have to work at the physical aspect. You have to be strong mentally. And then, uh, and then of course, you, you've got to take every aspect of your development as seriously as each other. So if you're working with people like yourself, Jim, you've got to utilize your specialities, get strong, get fit. You've got to utilize the coaches you've got to utilize your parents get their experiences get their advice um, and at Burnley we have some very good professionals so each player has got so much support they've got myself they've got the physical aspect they've got physios uh, they've got coaches they've got psychologists uh, they've got a nutritionist and that's all to try and create the most you know the most rounded athlete that we can possibly produce if we were just to focus on one area our success rate of producing players wouldn't wouldn't be that high. So a holistic approach, not only from the player, from the parents and the staff, to take every discipline as seriously as the other is is massive for me. Right. Thanks. Awesome. I'll turn it over to you now, Jason. Thanks, Jim. Um, I'm going to go back to Lonnie's question. So one of the one of the observations, Adam, was when you done the um, you showed us the video of the the assault course type thing. Yeah. Um, so that, that multi-sport experience over here, there's a, a common practice design. Um, what we know in England is the carousel model, um, where there's loads of different stations and, and, and you rotate round. So your concept there is quite familiar in Canada. Um, how often would you do those kind of sessions um, for the foundation phase, the nines to 11s? And how often would you do those, found, uh, those sessions for the older boys, girls, uh, 11s up? So the, the, the players do that carousel, multi-sport type, um, type session once a week with us. And that's just due to contact hours, um, availability, and obviously they have to do all the factors of the game, like the, mainly the technical aspect. Uh, but what we do hope and what we've got back from surveys is when they experience these sports and they, and they experience the fun environment and what they're getting from it, and it encourages them to go away and do these sports at either the school or actively seek out different sports in their leisure time. So that's, that's what we're trying to create here. As we progress through to 11s, 12s, 13s, we get them, um, we, we take them in the gym, but it's kind of very basic, you know, still fun, like med ball exercises, and we create different movement patterns, like animal patterns and things like that. And we make more structured, more structured sessions around that. Obviously, as we, as we go through to 16, 17, 18, as I touched on earlier, we, 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 do, we can do up to four to five sessions a week, Jason. It's, that's the demands that are placed on the players. Obviously, that's controlled. We don't just blast and there's a lot of, a lot of um, thought goes into it um, and a lot of science and a lot of feedback from players. But that's the kind of approach that we take. Just making it into uh, a kind of... Canadian example where they might not get the same contact time as you have if a, if a club trains with their players maybe once or twice a week 
would you still do that weekly for say 20 minutes or would you maybe say once every month you'll do a full session of the multi-sport type experience uh, no I'd, I'd definitely definitely incorporate it into your sessions 20, 20 minutes is, is better than nothing and and for me you can still develop like if 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 i come in and do one of your sessions jason and i work on a, a particular aspect of my physical performance for 20 minutes there's a lot i'll take from that there's a lot i'll learn from that you know, different movement patterns, different things that I haven't done before. And then I'll go home and I'll probably, I've enjoyed it that much that I'll probably do it at home as well. So I could be doing it three, four times a week, but obviously going into that environment and being coached that the key aspects of those movements is, is really important. But for me, the worst thing you can do in, in modern day football is just turn up, jog around a pitch and then kick a ball around. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to work on other aspects. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things you mentioned there, and you mentioned it earlier, is, is obviously fundamental is to have fun within these practices. But you mentioned that actually there's lots of different outcomes that come from it, whether that's um, with a ball and technical outcomes. Per Perry yesterday, when we had the technical discussion, he spoke the same, but on the reverse, that within a lot of his technical practices, many physical outcomes come as well. So yeah. I, think, I think it's a real good message for any coaches that, that, that are, are watching that, there's there's more than one layer to these practices that can be a benefit. So um, I think that's a really good message for the coaches to think about and maybe be creative with these practices. Um, simple, simple games actually can have some real good outcomes, whether it's physical, technical, whatever it might be. Uh, I'm going to fire on to the next question. And, and, and Adam, this is a good one. And, and I'll ask Jim to come back in on this one as well. Uh, so the question's from Kevin. Um, at what age can we introduce weights and workout machines to young players? Okay, that that's um, be the next two days of discussion. Now off you go. Yeah, so that's obviously uh, Jim might have his, his own his own philosophy in terms of this, but for me, it's not a generalisation of you can do weights at this age because one thing we, we take into consideration is England is the players' um, maturity status. So obviously, some players mature earlier than than other certain players, and if we feel a player has the movement competency and the strength to to it be introduced to weights then we'll do it and we don't say players are going to lift weights at 11 but we do it individual basis and we find that's the best way to do it because uh, if we did a generalized session and say right under 11s you, you, you're doing some weighted squats tonight and there was 50 percent of the players in there weren't actually physically able um, and mentally able to to take on you know those movements under load then we're doing that those athletes are more harm than good i think yeah, and to, I do agree with you, actually. Uh, and, and one thing that I would say in regards to that is that, you know, I think that, you know, kids at age is as young as as young as you could imagine. Let's say that. So let's just say my kids were tumbling and playing in the yard on a trampoline and doing all kinds of things when they were two, three, four, five, right? Then they went into gymnastics and they were rolling, tumbling. That's what they do. Like they roll around and they tumble and they, they do things that you would never think. I, I, people, when they aren't familiar with gymnastics and they go to the first class and they realize they're tumbling and rolling, it's, some kids cannot do it. Like it's, 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 it's crazy that they struggle with it. So mm -hmm. any kid that I've ever seen that's come through a gymnastics program before I've got them has always been superior in everything they do um, that I've seen uh, in Canada. So if I've had a uh, uh, you know, maybe a, a athlete that was in gymnastics from say five to say 12 uh, or 10, because our gymnastics program here is quite poor um, after that, they always go on to be elite in the sport they end up in after that. So I would say that body weight, uh, joint mobility, um, joint health, their ability to move, like you were saying, uh, Adam, I think that's mm -hmm. so important. And like you said, um, then for there, for us, my, what we do and what the domed method will be is, is holds. So ISO holds to develop actual strength with body weight and actually adding endurance into it. So it's actually quite challenging. And then from there on, they'll have supportive and structural strength and be able to support a lift like a barbell or being able to go on to do lifts. And that could be as young as age, you know, eight. So it just depends on where they're at. Do I think it's necessary to be loading an athlete at eight years old? No, not unless they're completely prepared and that's the level and that's the next step. So I think we, uh, we agree on that. Yeah, I mean, if I had any advice um, 
for, for a parent that's wanting the best for their child and wanting to, to push them and create a good athlete, I'd seek advice before you start to load the athlete. I'd seek professional advice from, from Jim or anyone else, um, and, you know, if, if you're going to get the most out of it. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Re really interesting topic, that one. Just uh, moving on to a question from Nate. Um, Adam, in terms of uh, game day, what's your philosophy around nutrition and supplementation? And how would that look from the younger age groups going up to some of the older age groups? If we start, if we start at the younger age groups, um, we, we, we teach the athletes the basics. So we say they've got, a, we call it fuel. So we say we've got a fuel, you've got to fuel your bodies before you come. And obviously it's a bit less structured at the younger age groups because we've got different types of travel. We've not got control over certain aspects of what they're doing up to the game. So we give them advice to get, you know, a good breakfast, good pre-match snack under the, under the belt, bring a drink, have an isotonic drink as well to drink during the game. And that's kind of what we do. So we're, just, we're starting to educate them. We've got some things up around the building. We've got workshops for the parents to try and educate them. Um, but it's just eat well, eat well the night before, eat well in the morning. Um, you know, if, if you want specific examples, it's something that I can share with you, Jason, that you can distribute some handouts that the, the players and parents can look at. Brilliant. Obviously, as we get into the full time environment, so 16, 17, 18, all the way up, we have more control. So typically, we will get the lads in. If kickoff is at one o'clock, the lads will eat three hours before the game. And that we find that's the, the optimal time to, for your food to digest and, and, and be optimal for when you start to play. Uh, we, we give them a little bit of protein, majority carbs um, for a slow release during the game. Uh, we monitor that hydration so they're already drinking water. During the game, we provide them with energy gels. Um, but obviously that's only if the player wants one and feel it's beneficial and we'll mainly give them at half time onwards um, to try and replenish those electrolytes and give them enough energy to, to keep performing throughout the 90 minutes. Um, I had a, a uh, webinar with a guy who works for Team Sky, Jason, the other day and he talked about he used to be the nutritionist when they were really successful and he was driving home fueling is the most important. So when they won the Tour de Italy, the Tour de France, that's the feeling was behind behind it. And if you don't feel your body, you're not going to be able to perform. As a player, when I didn't perform that well, I used to reflect and I used to be like, okay, what, what didn't I do? I played so well in the first half, but my performance dropped in the second half. And it was mainly once I seek the advice of a nutritionist, that's when I started to perform consistently. That's, that's really interesting. And, and probably looking at the relationship between the physical and the technical of a player, if you don't take care of the fuel, then your body's not going to be able to execute your technical actions. Um, yeah. So that one, relationship is really important. Yeah, definitely. One, um, one image I portray to the players, if you've got a Ferrari, so if you've got a Ferrari car and you put bad fuel in that Ferrari, it's not going to perform to its optimal. It's not going to perform like a Ferrari. If you've got a bad car, I don't know, I can't name a bad car, but when you put good fuel in, it's going to perform optimally. So you can have a great specimen, but if you don't fuel that specimen, then it's not going to perform to its optimal. Yeah, really important message. Love that. Um, so good question came up yesterday in, in the technical discussion with Perry where field size was um, mentioned. Now, around the facilities in this area, um, the field sizes are all FIFA regulation mostly, but they still differ in size. Smaller pitches bring out different technical components to larger pitches. How would yeah. that translate to a physical aspect? If, if we're playing, and, and obviously with the, the, the weather here in Canada, there's a lot more indoor soccer. Um, if we're playing 7v7 or 9v9 on tight fields, and then we play on larger fields when we go and play in alternate facilities, how does that change physically? What does tight fields do as opposed to the bigger fields? Yeah, so obviously you... Um Within that, you might, Perry might have touched on, obviously, on smaller fields, you get more touch of the ball. There's a lot more short, sharp accelerations and decelerations, so you can really develop your agility on a small pitch. As the pitches go bigger, you get less touches of the ball, and you do a lot more sprinting and a lot more endurance work, so you, you can build your aerobic capacity by playing on bigger pitches. And that's one thing we do at Burnley. So we have, for example, under nines who play on a small pitch, We'll expose them from time to time on big pitches to try and 
expose the, the athletes to that you know, aspect of their fitness. Um, if, if we constantly play them on small games, then we're not exposing them to those loads and those aspects of the performance. So we do that in a, in a structured way. Um, but obviously, yeah, the, the bigger pitch you play, you're not going to develop your technical aspects as much. You might do your tactical and your physical aspects as much. So yeah, it just depends. Does that so, answer your question, Jason? Yeah, yeah, it's good. And, and, and really important, I think, for us to understand that, um, and we spoke about that, diet but not it was more a, a, a hypothetical diet of small pitch experience and large pitch experience is really good for the players because they're getting a mix of that short sharp stuff as well as the yeah. longer distance kind of sprint endurance type work so um, I think I think that's really really interesting um, just going back to a, a, another question we had from from the chat is um, from Gracie how would a typical off-season workout differ from an in-season workout for a 17 to 19 year old. So, uh, just to confirm, Jason, does the off-season is it the, does it mean the same over over that? Is similar? Yeah. You know so, how the off-season structured over here, don't yeah, you? It's close season, but here the the seasons differ because there's a long indoor season and a short outdoor season. So there's actually two right. periods of of off-season here. So yeah, if we're talking if we're talking from the the way we do it over there, the off-season. It's a lot more extensive, so a lot more long distance endurance work. And obviously, that becomes more focused as we get towards the start of pre season. Um, so, if we, if we compare, if we compare the two, I'd probably say the off season is big, bigger distances, a lot more basic. And then, as we get the lads in the building, it's more in season, it becomes a lot more specific and a lot more intense and a lot more structured. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So really, really good topic on this one. A question from Keenan is how do you elaborate with how you communicate? Sorry, can you elaborate with how you communicate these um, physical development messages to the parents? Uh, yeah, so we, we host workshops in the building. So with the, while the lads, uh, well, while the players are training, we, we have many workshops with parents where we invite them to a room with tea and coffee and it would be myself or one of the other professionals, depending on the topic. Um, and we, we just have an interactive presentation with them. So it's nothing formal. We'll have a few slides on there, a few handouts, and we'll speak to the parents, um, open up to questions. And, and the players have found it really beneficial. We've got good feedback from that. Uh, previously, in, in, you know, we've, we've emailed things out. Um, we've, we give handouts, but it's not really been that effective. We found getting the parents in the building and having interactive sessions with them and relating to them a little bit more and asking the issues that they face at home or what they find difficult um, is the best way to do it. And obviously these, the, the, the younger age groups, if you, if you educate the parents and get their buy-in, it has a bigger influence on the players. Re really important, the, the message of education there. How, um, how important is consistency? When we spoke to, to Jen and, and, and looked at the psychology on Monday and then we spoke to Perry and technical last night, both times the, the common theme that went through their discussions was consistency of behaviours. Where does that sit with the physical side, whether that's communicating messages to parents and, and, and like or actually the work that people do? Sorry, sorry, Jason, can you just re repeat the question? So. So in terms yeah. of the consistency of message, so you, you meet from, with the parents, how often? Ourselves, you, yeah. yeah. How often? Yeah. That consistency, how important is it? it it's, it's, re it's really important. And we have, we're fortunate had to have what we call a, a parents lounge over, over at the academy. So while the players are training, there's a viewing gallery and the parents can go in, have coffee, watch telly, and interact. And we put subtle things on the walls in there that the, that the parents can read and little take home messages um, and, and that's found we found that really effective and obviously we, we relay these messages to the to the to the children as well but we do it in a little bit less structured manner we just sort of informally talk about them because we find the more information we give the younger lads the more they switch off and the more it just goes over the head so consistent simple messages is the way we do it Jason really really based brilliant basics which is a phrase you've probably heard before it's really simple messages and then obviously when when we lay these messages down, we can start to develop them a little bit more. Yeah, re really good, uh, 
really good example there. And Perry yesterday spoke of, of the value of the basics and doing the basics very well, yeah. um, which, is, which is really good. So we've just got a few minutes left. So I've got a couple more questions. One coming in from, uh, from someone we know, Noah. Um, can you give a practical examples of how you work with the on-field technical, tactical coaches to maximize performance? And my experience and what we tried to build in the culture back at Burnley was the technical staff and the physical staff having a better relationship. How, how do you do that and how has that evolved in, in, in recent times? It's uh, it, it, obviously since, since uh, um, I started working with you, Jason, it, it has improved. And that's one frustration that you had, I think, when we were at Burnley, the multidisciplinary approach. And obviously, as the more evidence is coming out in England and the Premier League of the importance of physicality of the players, the importance of sports science, I've found, in particular in the, the older coaches who, are, who tend to be set in their ways, they've become more receptive and more, more open to the ideas that we have. And my skill that I've learned is that you can't give too much too soon. You've got to educate the coach without patronising them. You've got to... You've got to prove the work that you do is beneficial and obviously we've collected quite a lot of data over the years which is which has proved this to the coaches so we we have a meeting in the morning and we discuss okay what as a coach what do you want out of the session okay we want to work on this we want to work on that 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 okay let's let's create a session that that ticks a few boxes for you and a few boxes for me how can we how can we develop and we, we we're getting good at that jason obviously we're still not perfect and a lot of the work I do has to be isolated with the players. Um, but it's before every session, I spend about 20 minutes with the players working on a physical component, whether that's speed. And to get the buy-in with the coaches as well, I have the ball involved as much as I can. So to get the buy-in from the players and the coaches, if you can relate it to a football as much as you can. Three key messages at the end of it. This is going to help. This is how this is going to help you on the pitch. And that's, that's the way I work, Jason. And I found, you know, I found it works. And, and I guess something that's important with that, Adam, is um, Liverpool dominating the Premier League and their style of play um, is awesome to watch, but there's a huge physical competence needed to be able to play that way. Oh, yeah. So yeah. That style Definitely. of play might be supporting the strength and conditioning coaches and the messages you're trying to share yeah. with coaches. I think with Liverpool, Jason, it took them a few years. They had a lot of injuries because the bodies weren't accustomed to the way that Jurgen Klopp wanted to play. But now, three years down the line, all the players are fit, they're robust, they're strong, and they can play unbelievable at counter-attacking football. Unbelievable pressing from the front. So it does take time, and that's one thing I've learned as well. It doesn't happen overnight. And if you're going to relate it to the players, it's the same for them. It takes time to develop. Don't get frustrated with yourselves. Develop, development takes time. I'm, I'm pleased you mentioned the players because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish there with, with the last kind of comment and question. is Going back to something you said earlier about holding the players accountable. For any of the players that have been watching this, um, what would the key messages be for them now to go forward? I, th I think the long-term development is a slow process is really important, what you just said there. But in terms of that accountability, um, hopefully no, no young players are going to go and run to a gym now and try and lift up <laughs> and big size weights. But what would the, what would the take-home message be for the players? Um, and then that's me going to sign out and, and hand over to, to Jim. Uh, if, if, I, if I had to mention one thing, it, it's be self-aware. So be aware of your strengths, be aware of your weaknesses and acknowledge those. You know, don't, don't, don't hide away from what, you, what you're not very good at. Work on them, but also work at the things that you're good at as well. And, and as, as Jim mentioned, uh, a holistic approach, which if, if some, some young people are watching now, holistic approach is where you take consideration to every aspect of your performance, not just one component. Think about everything and think, you know, speak to your parents, speak to the coaches. Um, but yeah, I don't really have a take home message. It's just kind of, you know, do the basics well and be aware of, of what you're good at and what you need to work on. I think that's a great take home message, Ad. <laughs> Brilliant. Ad, thanks very much. It's great catching up with you again on this series. It's great to see how you developed at Burnley and, and the great work and, um, you know, seeing Dwight McNeil break through to the first team, that, that doesn't just come because he's got a left foot. That's the holistic approach from all the departments. So great success with that. And I look forward to when the next one breaks through. Uh, Jim, I'm going to hand it back over to you. Then I think Noah's going to jump in right at the end. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Excellent. Yeah, no, I think, um, I think that was part of the, you know, 
I guess the vision and the mission of this of this the series was just to really you know I guess put put you guys uh, you know on the on the platform to kind of show this is what is being done to to do it successfully you know to do a holistic approach which you guys are doing which you've you've said works and and that's really what we're trying to do at the dome now is now take this sport and develop it like other sports in Canada like hockey we've we've really got that part developed I've worked alongside a team you know, for 17 years in the WHL. So I know what that looks like. And now the fun part for us at the Dome is now to take Jason's expertise with the game. And then now, uh, you know, me kind of jumping in in the same kind of role you're in and, and developing that program. So I just wanted to say thanks so much for your expertise and for your advice. And thanks for, you know, offering to help us. And, you know, we'll be, we'll be in touch lots to, you know, uh, just kind of refine our program and make it better. We're committed to making it the best we can possibly be. And uh, yeah, so I'll turn it over to you, Noah. Thanks a lot though, Adam. Pleasure. Yeah, thanks again, guys. Adam, seriously, that was great. Um, I still think like a player, even though I've been retired for a few years, but I know that I've been on teams where there's been a major disconnect between the S&C coach and the the coach on the ice. And so we're trying to go out and do certain drills and practice certain things, but we have super heavy legs. Right. And it's like, man, you can just tell you guys we're not communicating, you know? And so, um, what we're trying to do is, and then the other part of it is at the highest levels, even though they do make mistakes, like the one I just mentioned, they do have a holistic approach to the game. And so what we're trying to do at the dome is to bring that holistic approach of athletic development, and introduce that very early to our players, age appropriately, making it really fun and enjoyable. And that's where we get super excited to just see where that will take some of these, some of these kids. Um, knowing that whether it's professional or college, it's still going to be so good for them in life in general, right, to have these certain yeah. disciplines. So, But I guess what I get really excited about, and in particular with the academy that we're starting here at the Dome uh, in September, like. Jason and, and Jim have been working on a curriculum over a whole entire season, over a whole year. The detail that goes into this and, and how we're going to put the players first is going to be so good so that there's not many of those miscommunications where a, a, a player gets out there and is like, man, I'm, I'm struggling today because there's constant communication between Jason and Jim, right? So we get super excited about that, and it seems like – You've experienced that as a player and even as a coach, like you said, maybe it wasn't as good years past with Jason, but now it's a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, thanks for sharing everything that you had. And, and I guess uh, my last question for you is how do you – are there still barriers from your point of view as an SNC coach with your technical, tactical coach? Like, or are you more respected now? You know what I mean? Like, do you have yeah. a better voice? Or is it still like, hey, this is what's most importantly – you know what I mean? Because yeah, when the player I'm when sorry. both of you are super important, that's when you see the results, right? And when the yeah. – and the holistic approach is when you see the results. But it seems like there's still that little bite of like – Yeah, that definitely. In, in, in England, it's still a culture of coach is king. So the coach, the head coach, will always have the last say in, in what happens. And, you know, we, we know that we're, we're support staff uh, and we're there to support the coaches and get the best out of, out of the players. But, yeah, it's still, there's still barriers to, to, be, to be broken down, but it's, it's, it's a lot better and it's a lot better for us S&C coaches than it was 15, 20 years ago. We are getting the buy-in. We are getting a lot more time. I mean, I'm so lucky to have the time I have with the athletes. You know, at, at times it can be chaotic. I might have 25 players in, in, in the gym. And it's chaos, and it's but it's it's having time with the athletes. It's brilliant. I'm just there with a smile on my face. And I've got 25 lads in the gym. We've got two hours to do as much work as we want to do. It's it's brilliant. A few years ago, it wasn't like that. It was like the lads are back out on the grass doing football. You know, you're not you're not doing gym with them this afternoon. No, you're not you're not. You know, so we, we've we've got that buy-in now, and it's it's kind of a fundamental part of, of of football, of soccer. Sorry, soccer now is is um is the physical work so you know we're really lucky and I'm, I'm really lucky as well to work in such a good environment that's awesome yeah we're hoping to get that buy-in here in central alberta more and more and a lot of it's an educational process it seems like we have it in hockey for the most part and uh but you know with, with soccer it's 
yeah, it seems there's a strong emphasis with the on-field part of it, and that's what we're trying to educate people that it's it's everything. It's a, it's a, I mean, in the last in the last five years, I've worked with seven different coaches that have come and gone. The, the coach that I'm working with now has got 30 plus years as a as a coach, but also 20 years as a player as well. So he's very very experienced. So. It took me a few months to, for him to sort of change his mentality towards what, because he'd never worked with someone like me before. The, the club that he was at didn't have support that they have at Burnley, but now he's, you know, he's got he's got the buy-in. It's 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 really it's really good. I'm really lucky. And, and previously, I've worked with younger coaches who have been all for sports science and you know and, and seen the value in it straight away. So I've had those experiences as well, which has helped me become a more rounded professional and communicator. Sure. Once coaches, players, and parents see the results, that's where the buying comes. It's just getting them in the door to, to you know, to give it a try. So, mm -hmm. Adam, thanks so much. This has been awesome. Um, we are coming back tomorrow with talent identification, which is going to be really, really interesting. Um, yeah. So I could have a lot to say on that, but this is running long. So thanks everyone for joining in, and uh, we'll be back tomorrow. And Adam, we got to get you on a plane, man. To, uh, to <laughs> In the tip, though, you're welcome at the dome. Cheers, guys. Okay.